morning everyone. I think that was Car Hoot, so um, hopefully you've all downloaded the app or are able to access the Car Hoot through, through your browser. Um, that will come later because it's always good to build in a little bit of competition when I'm with sport-minded people. Um, thanks for the intro, John. Uh, I can still remember my first games as if it was yesterday. I remember receiving my kit bags, huge amounts of kit. And the difference being this time it had Team GB. Not British canoeing, but Team GB. I remember multiple trips out to Tennessee. I was a canoeist, part of the uh, British Canoe Slalom team, to prepare for my first multi-sport games, my first Olympics. I remember the anticipation of going in and waiting to go into the opening ceremony and Muhammad Ali, that frail old man that he was, lighting the, the flame. And I've got goosebumps now just thinking about it. I also remember the village, the scale of the village, the dining hall. I remember the reverberation of the crowd cheering as it came, the athletes came round a horseshoe uh, white water rapid. But it wasn't all, I guess, uh, fun and games. We were dubbed the team of shame in 1996. It was the worst performance by an Olympic team in over, British Olympic team in over 50 years. Um, and we, we won one gold medal. But I didn't feel like that after Atlanta. I actually felt inspired. I felt like I wanted to do more. I wanted to do more games, another games. I wanted to be better at what I did. And unfortunately for me, I wasn't in Atlanta as an athlete. I wasn't quite good enough, to be, to be frank. I competed for GB at junior under 23 and senior level. But Atlanta, I'd had two seasons of injuries, multiple shoulder ops, but I was coaching alongside. I'm a teacher by profession, uh, went into coaching. So Atlanta was my first multi-sport games and I was there as a coach. And I couldn't be prouder to be there representing my country as a coach, probably as I would have been if I were an athlete. Huge lessons learned from that first multi-sport games. We went on, I was in a similar role, a similar, uh, senior national coach, uh, for Sydney uh, and success came. We medalled in Sydney as a sport and we've multi-medalled in every subsequent games. So for me, that first game was really one of exploration. It was one of inspiration as well. I developed a games bug. I'm going to be going into Tokyo. Uh, we're, we're celebrating a year to go tomorrow, which it feels quite fitting to be here with you guys talking about multi-sport. Uh, at this time. Tokyo will be my 11th Games. Um, I moved over to what was the dark side of sport in 2001, para sports, yes. Uh, we had some brilliant athletes then, nobody knew anything about para sport. Fast forward to 2005 and the decision for London to host the Games. Fast forward to 2012 when the London Organising Committee absolutely smashed it. And para sport finally stepped out of the shadows. Those incredible athletes finally standing shoulder to shoulder with their Olympic counterparts. I think you guys have got a reasonably uh, re uh, recent history in Olympic sports. Well, I think you uh, joined the programme in 92, if I'm not wrong. Canoeing was first in the Games in 1972, and then there was a gap until 92. So we've been on a similar journey in some ways in terms of 92 through to 2000. Uh, uh, 2020. What I'm particularly, I guess, pleased about is the fact that para badminton has been introduced for, for Tokyo, and I'm sure that many of you in the audience are absolutely stoked about that as well. Now, I'm not, I'm not a badminton player. I did play a bit of badminton actually uh, at school and university, and I did. This is my, uh, I guess, link with you guys. In Atlanta, I went to the men's badminton singles final to watch the Dane, I think, Bi Jiong, the, the Chinese uh, guy. So that, that literally is all I know about badminton. And so I'm not going to try and tell you what you do best, which is your sport-specific knowledge. Um, but hopefully what I'm going to share in the next 35, 40 minutes is some of, I guess, my games experience. Because I do believe that multi-sport is different. 
And it's not different in a bad way, it's different in a really positive way. Um, so these are the guys that I work with on a day-to-day -day basis. They're team leaders, head coaches. They are the sport export experts, just as you are. Me and my team, we're experts in the games environment. We work with the IPC, we work with the organising committee. We're there to create an optimal environment in my current role for Paralympics GB. So it's really, really key that we develop relationships with, with you guys. And I think if we can bring that blend of sports-specific expertise, game-specific expertise, then we have a poten the potential to be best prepared for any multi-sport games. So I guess that there's going to be a little bit of information, a little bit of insights, hopefully a little bit of inspiration, and potentially a bit of fun over, over the next 30, 30 minutes. I'm, I guess, a self-confessed sports nut and games nut and I'm probably going to be biased when I talk about the games because I do think they're unique, I do think they're special. They only happen once every four years. That in itself is quite extraordinary. How do we prepare to be the best we can be for that two, three, four week period or that performance that comes down to one day, having been on a four, eight, twelve year journey? So if anybody tells you, just another competition, then you've got my permission to say, oh no, it's special, it's a multi-sport game. And that doesn't matter if it's a Commonwealth, an Olympics, a Paralympics, whether it's a junior event, they are all special because they're different. And we should respect the differences as much as we respect the similarities. Um, so let's hear from the athletes, not from me. The Paralympic Games are bigger than any other competition that you're ever going to go to. It literally, like the hairs on my neck, of my hand, the back of my neck stood up and because it was just such a loud roar and um, yeah, I thought, wow, this is big. I was very nervous at my first Paralympics, competed in front of the crowd, but after a little while I started to realise everybody was there to support you. So really do take it all in. Going out in front of the crowds, can be very nerve-wracking, but if you use it in the correct way, um, you can use it to your advantage and it can actually be really exciting and spur you on. The level of media attention at the Games is way more than at any other competition. It's given me a massive opportunity to show that even when you have a, a disability, you can still um, be brilliant at sport and excel and, and have some amazing matches. Paralympic Games is different because You've got such a community spirit between GB, everybody's willing each other on, everybody wants to win, everyone wants to get those medals, and it's just a huge, great atmosphere when you're chatting between different athletes from different sports. It's really nice um, being part of the bigger team, um, having that Paralympic GB kit on, because it just makes you realise that there's, like, you have this big army or team behind you, and it really uplifts just enjoy it. It's really cheesy, but it's true. You want to soak up every moment because after you've experienced it, you'll realise that you're never going to get that opportunity again. So embrace it. Give it a massive hug. <laughs> I think um, what stood out for me there is that the athletes are genuinely excited. They genuinely value being part of that bigger team on those once every four years multi-sport games. I'm going to pose a question to you guys now. How do you feel about multi-sport? Is it just another championship or is it something more? From my perspective, I believe they're the greatest global and continental competitions and we should respect that. It's the biggest stage on which our athletes will compete on. There's an opportunity for you to showcase your athletes and your sport. And there's also an opportunity to reflect on how current your competition format is. Have we got the right sport classes? Have we got the right classifications? Because we shouldn't take for granted that as a sport that we'll remain on an Olympic or a Paralympic or Commonwealth Games programme. The new norm is to check and challenge, to be fresh. So I guess as part of the process, I want you to think about what multi-sport means to you and how you're working, not only as in your roles as coaches or managers or leaders, 
but also how you're working with the International Federation to ensure your sport remains one of those coveted few on a Paralympic World Commonwealth Games program. So let's, let's drill down and, and let's see what the athletes were talking about. <laughs> Yes, I can. Gee, I'm afraid to go on as turned into. Yes, I can. Take a look what you see. 133 pounds of confidence in me. Got the feeling I can do anything. Yes, I can. Something that sings in my blood is telling me. Yes, I can. I was just born today. for me about the games is the sensory nature. What you see, what you feel, what you hear, even what you taste, that global, uh, the fusion of global food in the dining hall. The games are an amazing sensory experience and I think uh, you need to prepare for that sensory experience as much as you prepare for the technical experience, the performance experience on the field of play. As part of this process of, of preparing the presentation today, I, I just developed this little word cloud. I sat down for about two or three minutes and I wrote all the words that came into my head when I thought about the games. And I think maybe this is something that you can do later today or you know, in a quiet moment when you're travelling home, as to what do I think? What words come into my mind when I talk about or I think about multi-sport, not single sport, and straight away from me, the, a, a couple of things that come out. Over 200 nations competing in the Olympic Games. I don't think you get that in a single sport environment. 170 in the Paralympics. The process is linked to the Games. Words like additional team officials, accreditation, vehicle screening, VAPs. So I guess I'm just trying to draw out some of the differences so that we don't career into a multi-sport game as thinking, no, nah, it's just another championships, because it isn't. There are differences that we need to acknowledge, that we need to respect, that we need to embrace, we need to tackle head on so that we are best prepared for those what-ifs. We do understand the environment that we're going to be competing in or performing in, whether that as an athlete, as a coach, as a team leader. So, enough from me, it's competition time. There is a, there is a gift, so, um, or a prize, 
Um, who put your hand up if you've used Kahoot before? Yeah, a few. You've got you. You guys are definitely under pressure to perform them because you know all about it. So Kahoot, it's a bit of a, a sort of a trivia. Uh, there'll be a question. You'll have four answers, uh, and it's it's finger fast fingers. So it's not only whether you get the right answer, it's how fast you get the right answer. So I think you've all logged in. You should have a name, a username. Uh, the pin, if, are you all on the screen? You all on the screen? Yeah. The pin is 98131. Is that right, guys? 98131? No. Have a look at the screen. Oh, thank you. 690172. Okay, as soon as we've got as many of you logged in as are brave enough to take on the challenge, if you're not logged in, you can work in the pair. I'm happy with that. Give yourself a name. You may want to be identified, you may not. That is entirely up to you. Um, come on, 10 players. There must be 60 people in the room. Come on, don't be shy. It's not working for you? You can, be, you can buddy up with, uh, with your colleagues. Come on. Come on, come on, come on, a few more. Are we, re are we ready? 24? Oh, I think, John, I think we need a few more. We might have to get a big stick out in a minute. Come on, guys, don't be shy. Okay. You've got to press your screen. Which answer you think is correct? Fastest first. Counting down, five, two, one. Okay, not a bad start. Nine of you got it right. Of course it's 33. And next, please. Lucas, hands up, Lucas. Will you be there at the end? Okay, let's go. Are you guys controlling? Thank you. How many sports will compete at the Paralympic Games? <coughs> Easy one. Oh, yeah, you're smashing it. Pretty good. Tomster? Another early leader. We'll keep moving quickly through. Next question. What are the two new sports? Oh, you're going to get at least one of these right. Remember, it's fastest gets most points. New leader. Let's keep moving. You, those of you that are a little slow, it's okay, we've got another six questions. Again, this is an easy one. Okay, I think we can move on. It was, of course, mobile phones. And the next. Nearly halfway. How many times will Tokyo have hosted the Summer Olympic Games? And Paralympic Games. Proud actually of hosting the games for the second time, uh, and I'm sure they're going to do a great job. Okay, it becomes a bit more sport specific now, so pressure's starting to build. I'll sack my researchers if any of these questions are uh, the wrong answers, by the way.
14. Okay, I think the next one hopefully is a power question. DN, who's DN? Hands up. DN? We're counting down, press is starting to build. How many athletes will compete in your sport program in Tokyo? It's testing, isn't it? This? Okay, and moving on. Oh, still at the top, a bit of a commanding lead, but I think, you know, there's still, what, four questions to go, three questions to go. It, it can be overcome. You can. I think I've told you this one, but I could be wrong, of course. That's the day, isn't it? That's the day talking Situations that often happens, you need a contingency. Moving on. You could, you could obviously duff Rogelski, prevent him. Nine out of ten. China, Indonesia, South Korea, Malaysia. I think you feel confident on this, the answers are whizzing in. Okay, I think we can skip forwards. I think all the answers are in. And one final question. What's the venue for Tokyo Games? Bit of confidence here as well. Bit of confidence. Are we all there? Are we all there? Yep. And the big reveal. Brilliant, well done guys. Would you have a see? There is, there is a book. And it's uh, a signed book from uh, Roger McCall. If you'd like to come up and uh, receive your gift. Is there some boos there? That's not very teamy, is it? Come on, guys, you're all in the same sport. Okay, and we can click back into the presentation, please. Ah, oh. <laughs> brilliant, well done, well done. Okay, so preparing for multi sport games. In terms of the British Paralympic Association, Paralympics GB, we try and make it quite simple. It really is about understanding the environment. Not just the sport specific environment, but the wider games environment and understanding the team. So if you as sports specialists deliver your bit and we deliver our bit, then potentially we can end up with a successful games. Because that fusion of knowledge, of experience, understanding your sport specific preparation needs, you understanding the wider games context, what it means to be part of Paralympics GB, 22 sports, close to 300 athletes, a team size of 450. If we can actually come together and understand our, I guess, our respective positions and, and roles, then we can do something pretty special. One of the things that I meant to say early on is that um, we obviously have really close relationships with our national federations and, and I think for you to reflect on how you work with either your Olympic Committee, Paralympic Committee, Commonwealth Games Committee, to, to check and challenge them, are they providing you with the information that allows you to understand the environment so you can best prepare not only yourselves but crucially your athletes. Uh, let's hear a little bit more from the coaches and importantly here and I think it's really relevant for the para program two of these guys uh, uh, Colin from Canoe um, and also uh, Johnny from para Tri, they made their debut so their sports made their debut in Rio so I think hearing for them I think is, is particularly relevant certainly with the para guys 
pilot again what we live for in a Paralympic program. Phenomenal camaraderie within Paralympics GB. The immense amount of pride of my athletes when they're out there and they're delivering. Not only does it mean more to yourself, but it's probably the highlight of a lot of our athletes' lives. The thing I was most looking forward to was just taking our sport uh, and showcasing it to the world. Right from the start, I was just really looking forward to showing how good and how strong we were. My first games was the London 2012 games. The thing I was looking forward to the most was the fact that it was happening in London and that I was going to get the opportunity to represent Great Britain myself but also the Man Athletes were going to go and to put on their respective jerseys and, and demonstrate their capabilities in of uh, our own nation. The things that only a Paralympic Games can bring is the scale of the audience that will come and witness your sport. Um, the attention that your athletes will get at a Games will far outweigh anything that we you will have seen before. Um, the, the ability for the athletes to cope in those conditions is a huge significance in terms of preparation for such an event. Fundamentally, it's the same competition, um, same, same competitors, same field of play, just in a much bigger environment and pressure going around, on around the outside of it being part of that bigger team, but it really was, um, it was exciting and I think for me that was one of the things that really builds it. For the athletes to feel like they genuinely made it onto the biggest stage that Paralympic sport can offer, uh, the whole experience for the team was just an incredibly proud one. Okay, so we're starting to hear some similar messages that the competition, field of play may be similar or the same. Uh, there may be fewer athletes because obviously there are quotas, it's capped. Uh, but let's not be complacent about those similarities or the sameness uh, and let's really embrace and, and use those differences to enhance the overall experience for the athletes and for you as coaches and, and leaders. Uh, I, I, I'm sure that I'm going to go on to say the games are unique, trust me the games are unique because uh, it says it on the slide here. Um, whether it's the location, whether it be the culture of the country that you're going to, whether it be the climate, whether it be the, the team. For me, I've, as I said, going into 11 multi-sport competitions, no team is the same. How can it be? Because four years apart, normally for a Paralympic team, Olympic team, the attrition rate is about 50%. So the team is unique in itself. And how, how do we get the best out of that 450, 500 people, whether they're athletes or staff? Ultimately, it's about being best prepared. And if coaches and leaders aren't best prepared, then the chances are that you won't deliver the performances as a sport that, that you're capable of. So, you're the sport-specific experts. I'm not going to talk about badminton. I'm just going to pick five or six things that I believe make the games unique and things that potentially you need to certainly develop your understanding of, but also develop strategies for. Because if you don't, and listening to, to the coaches, it's that wider environment that has the potential to be the banana skin when it comes to delivering those personal bests when it matters most. Olympic Paralympic Village, it's like its, like its own community. Maybe 20,000 people, maybe more. It's a, it, it's a huge footprint. And certainly from a para perspective, there are things that we need to, to manage. Visually impaired athletes reflect on being, uh, taking time to orientate into that massive environment. It's not just going from a hotel to venue that you often do in single sport uh, competition. It's navigating from your accommodation to the dining hall, which could be half a mile away, and then to the transport mall that could be another half a mile away. How do, you, how do you deal with that for athletes that have got a lower limb impairment or a wheelchair user in terms of fatigue? The flip side, there's lots to do. So those athletes that are prone to, uh, I guess, lose um, momentum because they're bored, that doesn't happen in the games environment. There's recreation centres. It's a, it's a melting pot of nations. There's always something to do. The flip side of that is, do, do athletes do too much? Do they get over-aroused, over-stimulated? Does that drain their energy when it comes to competition? So lots of things that you need to think about when it comes to the village. You won't be in a single bedroom with maybe a, 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 um, a, or a twin. You could be in an apartment of eight, ten people. You could be on a floor that contains 60 people. They could be from a different sport. How are you going to uh, ensure that you, you 
you rub up well against each other. You could be going out early in the morning, they could have evening competitions. Is the noise on the corridor? How can you as a coach work with a coach from the other sport to ensure that, that you're harmonious? You create a symbiotic relationship whereby you respect the competition schedule of the other sport. How can you, I guess, as coaches, as leaders, ensure that you help create that multi-sport games environment that functions as well on the final day, and there may only be 10, 20 people competing, as it did on the first day when there could have been 150 competing, because those athletes deserve that respect and they deserve that environment intact, and you're part of that environment. Ceremonies. Potentially one of the most contentious things. Do we or don't we go to the opening ceremony? I talked at the start about sitting in the holding stadium, just the sense of anticipation of going into my first opening ceremony, and it was bonkers with the British rowers. One of the coxes fell down the ramp on the way in, got trampled. We were all there, you know, you're there for hours. But at what performance cost to sports competing early in the schedule? Who makes the decision? Do you make the decision as head coaches or as team leaders? Do you involve your team? If you take your team on a journey, you might avoid some of the situations that I've had as chef de mission, athletes knocking on my door just before the opening ceremony. Penny, I really want to go. I don't agree with the decision of my team leader. I think it will add to my performance. It will lift me. So I guess my, my comment here is manage that part of the process early because you can make that decision a year in advance. You can make that decision now. You know your competition schedules. Does it fit for us to go to the opening ceremony? It pretty well fits for everybody to go to the closing ceremony, but your athletes need to own that decision so that they're not mithering, they're not angsty about not going when it comes down to the day. Media. I think uh, one of the coaches talked about the media. And again, my comment to you, and it's something that I really don't understand. Some team leaders and coaches, no media, no, 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 no. Why not? Tennis players come off the court five hours, absolutely battered. And what do they do? They go and sit and they face the media. It's part of what they do. Program it in. You want your athletes to be your best advocates to promote your sport. You can only do that if you work with the media. And, and my personal feeling is it's better to develop those relationships, those ways of working. You can determine some of the conditions, but encourage your athletes, encourage your team leaders not to fear the media because it is those images beamed to global audiences that will spread the word of your sport. What an amazing sport it is, how accessible it is. It can be played anywhere, anytime. You want the media to be your friends and for you to be the friends of the media. Crowds, yeah, as I said, Akoi, 15,000. How many did you get for World Championships? You guys are pretty good, actually, I think, generally for crowds. But in Parasport, in Athens, I sat in the Olympic Stadium watching Tanny Gray Thompson, who's a, a superstar in Parasport. And there was about 300 people, a couple of dogs, and that was about it. We fast forward to London and watching Hannah Cockcroft, 80,000 people watching Parasport on the first session of athletics in the lunchtime, unheard of. So it's a huge difference to step up from a couple of hundred people, I don't know the capacity of Mishishino, but potentially to 5, 10, 15,000. And again, will your athletes respond positively to that crowd engagement? And the games are, are immense. I mean, you know, the, the, the spectators really want athletes to succeed. There's always heroes and villains, but, uh, you know, you want your athletes to, to be ready for that roar, and it will be a roar, especially when the home nation uh, are involved. Finally, security and accreditation. And just a word of warning here, it is part, it's a fundamental part of the games, of any multi-sport games infrastructure, and, and my advice is to respect it. It's there for a reason. Um, your accreditation allows you to do your job, but it's again, it's very emotive. Your team leader will make a decision as to whether you as a coach are accredited or not. You could be accredited and have full access, you could be non-accredited and really struggle, or you could be in the, in the crowd on, on the ticket. So 
when you know your allocation, the best thing, the best advice is to actually simulate what you're going to be able to do at the games, both as an individual and as a squad. So in canoeing, uh, going into uh, 96, we ring fenced a race. So we only took the staff that were going to be accredited or part of the environment and we operated exactly how we were, we were planning to do when we got to Atlanta. So that sort of game simulation I think is something that is absolutely critical for success. So we talk about planning for success and I think that's one of them. Also, culturally, uh, some nations don't respond well if you abuse accreditation. We had an IOC official in Pyeongchang who abused a volunteer uh, around access to a certain area which he believed he should be allowed into. Uh, it, was, it was taken really seriously by the organising committee and that member was uh, de-accredited and sent home. Similarly in Tokyo, we already know that they will be very strict in terms of accreditation. So again, you need to manage it early, both in terms of you as coaches, how are you going to operate, but also that the athletes don't rely on a coach who's not going to be accredited or won't have the access and don't think that you can blag your way around it because that's not really, that's a high risk tactic and not one I would necessarily uh, recommend. So those are some of the differences. Uh, how do we deal as Paralympics GB with some of these differences? This is what we call a VMOST, it's, it's, a, it's a model that UK sport uses and I'm just going to step to the side here. One of the most important bits on this um, uh, model is the top, the vision. Through sport, inspire a better world for disabled people. So in my role, I focus very much on the, the objective of to deliver a best prepared team. But we have a twin track ambition. One is, is success on the field of play. The other is, I guess, promoting what sport can do off the field of play and we believe that the, inspir the incredible inspirational Paralympic athletes using the media to, to go global they demonstrate true ability and I think that that is, is a huge part of, of I guess my involvement in Paralympic sport uh, to show that the impossible is actually possible uh, and hopefully to, to get others to, to consider whether it be sport or in other occupations that they do have, you know, everyone has an ability um, and, and actually to create opportunities for those abilities to shine. Within my best prepared strategy we look at five different things. We look at um, being unrivaled in our knowledge of the environment which I've talked at length about today. We talk about having specialism in, in mandated services, so whether that be classification, anti-doping, those things that our international federation expects of us. We create opportunities to bring sports together to create that multi-sport preparation uh, environment, which then we believe acts as a springboard into the games. So starting to develop those, those relationships, understanding other elements of our team. We talk about being games ready and that is a key phrase for us and then ultimately how do we work together to create that optimal environment in games time when athletes from different sports, staff from different sports come together, how can we be as good on the final day as that we were uh, on, on the last. And for me pre preparation of the team is the whole team, it's not just athletes, it's not just staff but it's also supporters, friends and family do get some bad press, uh, but I think if you work with them, if you educate them, if you help them understand the environment, they can actually become a performance advantage. So don't leave any stone unturned, and a huge amount of, of our time goes into developing that under, understanding of the environment, whether it's through uh, education programmes or whether it be through actual physical time in the environment. We have a, a, a model that looks at themes. Um, we work with our sports throughout the four year cycle and ultimately games readiness for us impacts on these areas. So the team itself, pre-games prep, common village environment, Tokyo itself, heat, humidity, travel, jet lag, travel fatigue, um, athlete and staff, staff health. Health and well-being is, is massive for us all at the moment. Um, being educated, using games education, anti-doping, friends and family. And we work on a continuum of, of being completely unprepared, haven't thought about it, to actually, if the games were tomorrow, we'd be ready. And I think that um, 
what this, this tool, this process allows us to do is to gather huge amounts of data and to actually be able to manipulate that data and use that data as part of our best prepared strategy. So uh, all of the sports, have a, they self-rank, it's not our ranking, and it allows us to capture actions, priority actions, uh, it allows us to assimilate themes, are there themes coming through, whether it be mental health, well, it, whether it be uh, the requirement to develop friends and family education packages, uh, and ultimately it allows us to, to, to track over time, so are we moving in the right direction, do we have any red flags, are there recurring issues that, that we need to solve. And when it comes to testing, it's really important, and I think you guys have test event opportunities in uh, Tokyo next year. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you are, are, are following what's going on in Tokyo at the moment. A year to go to the Olympics, just a couple of weeks ago, a year to go to the Paris tomorrow. Triathlon testing last weekend, and talk about knowing your sport-specific rules. Two British female athletes absolutely smashed the field to pieces, decided it'd be great to run over the finish line together, hand in hand both were disqualified. That was an Olympic qualification event for those athletes. That was the rule, it was in place, they should have known it. The para event became uh, duathlon because of the water quality. So testing is critical and if you've got an opportunity to test, do it and learn lessons from it. For me it's all about thriving in the environment. How far are you prepared to go to create the environment that's optimal for your team? Rio, for anybody that was there, was quite challenging. Um, and my first task as chef de mission was to clean the apartment that my team were coming into. I was first on the ground. Then my team basically cleaned the rest of the building before our athletes came in. We had one ambition, that was to make the building shine. And when the athletes arrived, despite all the noise that had been going on, would the para games happen? It was as if we were in a normal games environment. So what are you going to do behind the scenes to, to make sure that the environment for your athletes is the one that you want? But it is about enjoyment, not endurance. It is about thriving, not surviving. And how are you, how do you determine that, that boundary between creating an environment that is just intolerable? And I've been in a few of those games. And when I first got the chef gig in 2014, I vowed that however hard we worked as a team, we would come out smiling because we'd worked hard, we delivered, but ultimately we'd created a positive team environment that we all enjoyed. And the final thing is that's... Probably all be the same plan, plan, plan. Um, I think the what-if scenario planning, um, the hypothetical situation that you could find yourself in are really important in case you do find yourself in that specific situation but simply getting into that mindset of how do we quickly tackle things that arise on the hoof is, is vital to, to thrive in the multi-sport games environment. Preparation and enjoy it, I, definitely they're the two key ones, but on that, I think people go to the games and try to sort of have some greater impact than they would do at their world, so I think keep an eye on that. I think if you've prepared everything beforehand, don't try and do more than you normally do. Keep everyone relaxed, because I think sometimes people go with this, this assumption they need to do more of the games, but actually by not trying to do more, you tend to keep everyone else relaxed and really focus on those bits that you do every time you go and try and perform. I suppose for me, you're going to be hit by things you don't expect. You can't plan for that, so what you can do is you can plan for what you can control, be in the best possible um, position to deal with anything when it hits you. Um, preparing your staff and athletes for the environment they're going to be in, nailing down the technical aspects of your planning way in advance, and then being prepared to enjoy every single opportunity that comes your way. Sorry. Um, that really is it from me. I, I think the, the summaries from the coaches were, were quite poignant in terms of enjoy every moment. The games truly are special. We have limited, I guess, opportunity, unless you're really old like me, to go to multiple games. Um, but I think going to the games to deliver those personal best performances is, is why you guys are here today. Um, so I, I, I hope the last 45 minutes have been useful in, in terms of what we do at Paralympics GB. Um, I hope there's been some insights in terms of 
where those differences do really exist and, and will help you not only to be excellent in your own sport specific uh, sphere but also in that wider games uh, environment and, and I hope maybe just a little bit of inspiration whether it be uh, looking ahead to Tokyo which is just a year year away or to, to Birmingham 22 or, or to what your next I guess major goal is uh, I feel hugely, hugely privileged to, to have had uh, half a lifetime involved in professional sport um, and I'm as motivated today uh, about my next games as I was going into Atlanta in 1996 so thanks for your time to, today guys thanks for taking part in Kahoot and congratulations to our resident athlete I didn't say that did he um, and enjoy the rest of the conference thank you very much Thank you, Penny. Um, we do have a couple of minutes for questions if anyone has, has any questions and I'll, I'll throw it open to the floor straight away. Um, if anyone has a question for Penny, please raise your hand, wait for the microphone to come in and we'll get that to you as quick as possible. Okay, well, there's one at the back, Alistair, I think. Uh, thank you, Penny, for a fantastic presentation. Obviously, the, the insights of someone that's so experienced. Um, what has been one of your bigger challenges when you are um, at an Olympics or a World Championship event in para sports? Is there any that you can name that are that I stand mean, out? Yeah, I mean, the biggest challenge, without doubt, was was Rio. We knew it was going to be challenging going in, um, and the, the news coming. We we had the uh, the news coming out that the, the organising committee, the city government was bankrupt and there were going to be either massive cuts to the power programme or it might not even happen. You know, that was May 2016 and you know, that for the athletes was really unsettling. So from my, my role with Chef de Mission was to work through the team leaders to try and create, I guess, a sense of calm that it was business as usual and hence I was out super early uh, working with the Olympic, uh, my Olympic colleagues to, to, I guess, suss the lay of the land, what exactly was going on and then just to put strategies in place. So the issues in the village were that the clean, that there was widespread theft so the cleaning was suspended. The buildings then, it, 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 was, you know, it was a disgusting environment to go into. So we had to hire our own cleaning team. We hired our own security team. And we just had to come up with a plan really quickly. So I guess, you know, things will happen in a multi-sport environment because that environment is so vast. And I think the challenge, and, and one of the coaches said, is, is just to plan for those what-ifs. And you, you, know, you can't plan for every what-if, but if you are resilient, if you are agile in terms of how you operate in that environment, then I think you can get back onto the front foot. And we certainly did that. So we, we set ourselves that one simple target. Let's make this building shine. And I think when, on that, that final slide where I've got my mop, um, you see a lot of smiling faces and that's athletes and staff arriving in environments and it's like, hey, whoa, you know, we, we, we were expecting it to be carnage, but actually it just looked like business as usual. And so, you know, that was without doubt the most challenging. Uh, but you'll get a whole range, you know, I, I wouldn't have wanted to be in Mike Cavendish, who's the performance director for British Triathlon Shoes last weekend when the women's race first, first of all was reduced from a 10k run to a 5k run because of climatic conditions and then two, two of the best athletes in the world DQ'd for a major infringement and then the para you know, becoming a, a, a duathlon but you just have to be prepared to deal with those things so I think the more you can test yourself and how you respond in stressful situations that are operational just as you would prepare yourself to respond in performance situations that are stressful. I think the better really. Um, I think relationships are key. So how confident do you feel in your relationship with your National Olympic Committee, Paralympic Committee? Uh, do you feel that, 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 that it is symbiotic? Do you feel like you're working together? They're supporting you. You're, under, you're developing your understanding of, of their role. Um, and I think, you know, it, relationships are key really. Having the right people on the team is, is also key. I mean, I, I've got an incredible team at the British Paralympic Association. 
Um, and you know, they're all really motivated to create that environment that supports you and your athletes to be able to deliver your, your personal best performances when it matters most. One more question, we've got one at the front just here. The microphone's just on its way. Yeah, I was wondering about the opening ceremonies. We gave a little bit of feedback about that, and Bamathan does start the following day, and I'm just, because we've already talked to our athletes about the potential of not participating, and I'm just wondering, did you defer back, or did you give feedback to them? Yeah, ultimately, from a, from a chef de mission perspective, it's a sport-specific decision. So I will not say you cannot. Some sports have a very um, clear policy. It could be if we're competing within three days, we will not. As a t and, and that's almost a stated uh, part of the team charter, if you like. Others, there's, it's a little bit, it's a little bit more grey. So my advice would be find as much out as you can about the timings. How long? is the process and it becomes quite long when you muster in your building you get to transport and you get off transport you muster in the holding area at what point does your nation march so you, you can plot how much time is there a quick exit and most of the organizing committees now to be fair do allow you basically march and then you head straight down the tunnel uh, if you feel that you know that can be contained then you know then it becomes a possible but then I think you then, if we're talking about athletes with an impairment, we then need to add that in as to what impact might that have on that particular impairment. You know, is it an athlete that, that has a lower limb impairment that would be fatigued by standing for, for that time? So, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's very emotive. And I think that if you can address it with your team early and agree the, the, the position, I think it's by far the best position because it's, it's dealt with its part. Sometimes it comes back up again, but if you then refer back to the principles, and I certainly referred back to the principles a couple of times when I had athletes knocking at my door, then you know, I think that that's, that's probably the best that we can do. I mean, you don't want athletes not to enjoy the experience because it, it is incredible. Um, but I think most athletes in this era especially are, 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 are true, true professionals and they want to be ready for that for day one of competition and they're actually quite channeled in that which is, is, that, is actually a nice position to be in. Great, thank you for your questions. I'd just like to invite Wayne Summers from the BWF Council to present a small token of appreciation to Ken. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone, enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.